uh, I try to contribute to the sphere uh, through the use of um, what we call mechanism design and uh, systems design. So basically, this is um, reverse game theory. So you start with a set of outcomes that is uh, the desired state. You know, we want a more equitable production, cultural production. We want uh, better funding mechanisms in. Uh, performing arts you want um, to kill the role of the producer or uh, whatever uh, and then you start designing the game around these outcomes so that whoever interacts with that labyrinth which is the game uh, goes towards these outcomes it's quite a uh, i think controversial mechanism as well because uh, that's what uh, you know these platforms that we're not supposed to feed are kind of uh, flowing their users, uh, you know, unconsciously to uh, spend the most time on their platform or buy the uh, most products and so on. But I hope that the difference that we're bringing to the table, um, like Jay, uh, you know, also covered, uh, is that we're doing it all in the open. So there is no manipulation that's happening, uh, you know, behind the curtains uh, where we're trying to, you know, achieve a behavior that's uh, uncalled for. Um, so, yeah, when I started dipping my toes into what are these objectives that are, uh, that we're going to put at the center of the game that is the sphere, um, yeah, I wanted to understand better sort of uh, from the vision that uh, I'm inheriting from, I mean, I don't want to say inheriting, but it's a little bit hard from uh, Sarah and Ulle uh, towards, you know, creating something uh, functional. And for that, I had to understand what are these design objectives. So last time we came together um, in this very building in September, uh, I facilitated a session called um, uh, <coughs> Digital Soul Searching, because uh, like this sort of the mythology of the digital soul was taking shape and I was uh, also really inspired by it uh, coming from you know a smart contract programmable uh, uh, contracts paradigm I like this romanticization of uh, you know something that is living almost has a life of its own that uh, interacts with a cultural scape uh, in a very impactful way and I really like this idea uh, essentially so what I thought was missing was a tangible way that uh, this digital soul would essentially uh, manifest itself in IRL. So, um, so if you look at the dictionary definition of an organization, it points towards an entity comprising of one or more people uh, which have work ah, okay. which have a particular purpose and since we check the people box uh, uh, we, we have to find this particular purpose right so uh, during the session that i facilitated we came up with uh, a set of objectives perhaps Here we go. so at the very left, you see um, narratives which are influencing the objectives, which are influencing the patterns. And then from the patterns, we go towards the tools and uh, basically this talk uh, that's going to be happening right now. So just to give a little bit of uh, an explanation, if you can't uh, visualize it perfectly, uh, we have uh, the producers will to self-destruction. These are, again, narratives, don't take them, you know, to, to their maxim, like uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, sir. Uh, then we have artist precarity, what Ule was mentioning about, uh, you know, the bureaucrats uh, staying fully uh, employed during the time of crisis, while the artists are being sacked by the system. And also the monopolization of the state influence on cultural production and undertap audience potentiality. So these are sort of the, you know, in a way, uh, the narratives that will inform our objectives and the objectives i harvested during the session again these are not uh, you know final these are impressions 
uh, were distribution of power, empowering the economy, the mechanization of culture production. Uh, all right. Um, production stewards, production stewards that I'm going to unpack a little bit further, uh, shifting the flows of funding, uh, fungible performances, and invested audiences. And these are going towards these patterns that, uh, you know, I think alludes to some of the questions that were being asked earlier. You know, uh, okay, we're going to replace the role of the producer as it is, but what is going to be the replacement? And I think uh, some elements inside the uh, organization of early sphere, um, like what Lene told us about this uh, structure of uh, self-organization called uh, Loom. Um, I think this type of uh, sharing of roles or rotation of roles uh, in a larger organization could be very interesting to utilize. Um, production steward refers to creating sort of a production house shell form, which, uh, you know, everyone who is part of this common structure can actually uh, you know, uh, take benefit of, uh, and we have yeah non-monolithic production and versioning. So, not a work as this monolithic entity, but a work that can always house this potentiality towards different directions. And obviously, decentralized governance, as in uh, you know, people who are part of a system can exercise ownership on the system as well. So. Yeah, so I have uh, created from this distillation, you know, second distillation layer where I wanted to create a stack, uh, which Ulla was referring to earlier, which uh, consists of, I think, essential elements that an organization has to incorporate within itself, which is, uh, you know, sustaining its energy flows, uh, having institutional memory. So this you can think of it in a cellular structure as DNA, for example, uh, creating synergy within its parts and establishing trust of uh, what is its interior versus what's its exterior. Um, and these ones, you know, in human readable format is creating alternative funding mechanisms, creating an IP commons for its institutional memory, uh, creating functional integrations for its uh, synergic functioning and creating a web of trust for uh, maintaining coherence of who gets to be part of this uh, thing and who not and how not to be fascistic about that. Um, so this is obviously a monumental set of objectives to achieve. <laughs> But uh, I guess with enough time and energy and playfulness, perhaps a relevant intervention can be designed. So today I will talk about uh, this approach towards designing the cyber physical infrastructure of the sphere. And even though it includes quite a bit of technical terminology, which I will uh, do my best to unpack, um, but I will try to keep everything you know, as playful as possible and uh, you know, um, away from academic uh, formalization. And like I said, I, I will try to spill over all the you know, toys that I'm interacting with uh, in my day-to-day -day, uh, life as a system designer in open source. So an important place to start as well is to, um, all right is to talk about what open source is. Um, open source is a software paradigm for which uh, the source code is made freely available and uh, for this redistribution and modification according to uh, the requirements of the user or the designer. And composability is a, a system design principle that deals with the interrelationships of these components. So when you bring together these two concepts, you get uh, you know an, an open knowledge paradigm where uh, you know everything that everyone produces creates a new potential for uh, you know new works to emerge essentially, 
And in my uh, company, which I call a lab, uh, this is the main modality of working. We are constantly watching uh, what new thing pops up in the environment. New organization development. So uh, the designer in mm -hmm. such a paradigm is uh, very similar to a chef. A chef, which uh, I guess also was mentioned in this uh, discourse earlier. Uh, I think uh, I forgot his name, but anyway, uh, someone mentioned in the chat. Uh, a chef goes to the market, picks the right ingredients, and assembles them in a unique way to uh, you know, create an experience. And in a similar way, we're going to start trying to tackle uh, how we can do that with the sphere. So I want to show you uh, our shopping bag for today. So in our first layer, we have uh, the potential for creating an alternative funding mechanism for uh, the performing arts. And uh, for this, I have a very interesting ingredient, which is called quadratic funding. So when I was thinking about the funding uh, mechanism, because I was you know, in inheriting this dream of you know, plantoid, this plant that recreates itself, creates versions of itself, and you know, gets called by the community and so on, this amazing dream, uh, which I am very much uh, buying into. Uh, but there are a lot of problems uh, with this design, uh, namely that people, real people, don't use blockchain. You know, real people don't have uh, crypto wallets. So it's going to be very hard for them to send Ethereum to an address and you know, call this uh, performance to where they are and so on. Uh, so this is one problem. And the other problem is that contemporary circus arts is predominantly, as far as I understand, uh, is funded by these support structures uh, from the state and so on. So uh, in, in our last conversation also in September, this, we, we got this feedback that, oh, maybe you shouldn't use this word of revolution so much. You know, what about reform? <laughs> <laughs> And revolutions are you know bloody and so on and it, it was you know funny because like you don't get the uh, you know structural change with uh, reform uh, in reality so, mm -hmm. so I, I was looking for a revolution that would coexist with uh, the existing support structures because i mean you don't want to go go, uh, go overboard and you know, get everyone unemployed by the state by creating an uncalled for conflict yeah um, so we are looking at quadratic fund funding as a, perhaps a mediator between this revolution and reform. So it's a very interesting mechanism that came out of the radical markets movement. Currently it's being used by the crypto ecosystem and Taiwanese government to distribute grants in a democratic fashion. We will come back to these examples later. So this uh, method of collective decision-making system where instead of each person getting uh, one vote, individuals have a budget and can pay for additional votes. However, the cost of additional votes increase as more votes are cast. So cost to the voter equals number of votes squared. So your cost is quadratically increasing. That's why quadratic uh, voting is called. So uh, quadratic voting as a model inspired this model of quadratic funding uh, which is the similar model where you can buy your vote. Essentially, you can, uh, you know, going back to Jay's perfect depiction of this, uh, you know, Kickstarter-like interface where there's all these grant proposals, you know, performances asking to be funded. Um, so invested audiences can go to this interface and pick which ones they will donate. So in a similar way, at every dollar, their impact uh, of donation uh, is being diminished in order to reduce the effect of uh, capital. So the way this is done is that first, uh, let me see, oh, sorry. So um, 
quadratic funding systems create a, a pool of uh, sponsors. So, say Sweden is funding uh, circus arts. <coughs> how much uh, per year? It's, 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 clear. It, it's unclear it's because unclear. Uh, now uh, we can say that now they gave uh, we can earmark money, not much. Now they gave seven, seven million a year to Drix Delfin. Uh, that's maybe thirty percentage of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's say one million euro a year, yeah. maybe in project money and um, one or two little grants, which are kind of for somebody for a one year project. Yeah. Or, and now with the risk of the new Let's Lift Circus. So, say maybe one million euros, 10 million Swedish crowns mm -hmm. yes. for 2021. Yes, and then some uh, perhaps more in regions. If yeah, some regions like somebody mission. has a project or something, but yeah. not like let's say that that's the one who's earmarked, otherwise, mm -hmm. the uh, of course, the presenter can decide what to do with their money. Mm -hmm. But that money goes to the presenter, All right. not in to let's the stick to, the artist. Let's, let's stick to, to one million, million yeah. euros for, so, yeah. as an example. So in this system, the uh, the state apparatus would allocate this million to this reserve pool. Uh, this can, this reserve pool can be extended to corporate sponsors, patrons, uh, uh, whoever you like. Uh, so. You have the pool here, and then you have the you know Kickstarter-like interface here, where people start you know funding their uh, favorite projects. So, this pool has a logic of allocation that is uh, similar to that, where it matches the uh, funding, the donations given by the users, similar to this algorithm. So, it says. Your first dollar will be matched by ten dollars, while your second dollar will be matched by five dollars. Your third will be matched by two dollars, and so on. So, as you you're a very rich person and you want to really support uh, Ulle because uh, you're you're in a oligarchic relationship with him, yes. uh, <laughs> um, this system starts. Uh, sensing that and uh, stops giving preference to uh, matching your funds and it prefers the expression of plurality uh, you know, allocated to one project so essentially what we have here is that uh, we're going to see in this uh, example where uh, we are actually using this in pr production in the crypto ecosystem where we are funding public goods uh, which is already in itself like a hard concept to define but uh, let's say goods that have collective interest that doesn't have a clear business model, which I think circus is uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, doing a good job in uh, you know, being around there. And I, I think that's beautiful because you know things that have a clear business model are usually uh, you know uh, extorted somehow. Um, so with Gitcoin, uh, I think around. Uh, Three million in each round are allocated to uh, projects that are building decentralized infrastructure. So things that I am using to bring together and create further systems and so on. So I want to show you their interface. So um, here you see on the right, Dai is a stable coin which is back, uh, a peg to the dollar. So you can think of it as dollars. So here you, on the right you see. How much uh, DAI allocated? 1,276 DAI raised from 98 contributors. And it is matched by the matching pool by 4,139 DAI. So, and below it shows how the algorithm uh, expresses its preference for a unit uh, of allocation. So, one DAI is matched by $77. Uh, and a hundred dollars is matched by hundred and ninety-five dollars. So you see there mm -hmm. that it's incentivized other options for uh, allocating the rest of the money. So, yeah, as I said, this is um, a very interesting way that uh, we are testing in production in the crypto ecosystem. That um, that's actually working, although it's not crazy amounts of money, but. Uh, we also don't have any state backing us, so like maybe in a, uh, a different 
synergic with a different infrastructure, it can look uh, much more different. And where is this initial money coming from? Like the matching money? Oh, in this so case? In this case, it's coming from well funded crypto uh, companies, essentially, which uh, you know, um, have a sense of the commons, yeah. know, have an understanding that, oh, we need this ETH app, which like everyone is using, but there's no fee for it. Like, how are we going to get developers to build, build that? Or like, developers to eat uh, uh, food, you know? So um, that, that is logic. Yeah, that's the top of that. And so you see here at the bottom, the blue is a fixed amount of capital allocated by contributors, donators, and it's fixed at 275 bucks. So if you increase the number of contributors, so if you have one person putting 275, you get 550 matched. If you have 10 people, you get 3,025. Uh, I think this is clear by now, yeah. <laughs> the logic. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think this, this type of infrastructure could be uh, very interesting uh, to deploy right away and you know, test with, uh, without isolating the state infrastructure uh, too much. You know? Which is like a lot of conversation. Does this model mean that you need a bunch of well funded uh, basic uh, funders for, for the fear, for example, if, in order to make it work? Uh, you, need, you, you need an interested public and you need a matching pool. A matching pool yeah. meaning that you can have this sort of uh, funding from, again, the state or other. Yeah. Kinds of yeah. Yeah. Bunch of money in a start, and then you need an that that is the steroids that uh, powers sort of this machine. Yeah, you know you can have. Otherwise, it's Kickstarter. Yeah, you know people don't mm -hmm. need stuff, but yeah. this actually really empowers in a democratic logic. You know, um, that's the noble part of this mechanism. Mm -hmm. Essentially, and can I ask you? Please. Coming back to if the sphere has existed for three or four years and we've done the first productions that have some EU funding to start with and they actually clay and start returning some of their excess then into, they would, that income, mm -hmm. which is the excess returning yes. to the sphere, would then be the base for the capital. Yes, that's a beautiful So point. it's a pyramid game going back to the sphere well, instead, or, or like, not a pyramid, no, it doesn't because it's a circle, yeah, yeah. Exactly, okay. so actually it's- so After a few years, it could be self-financed and that, people could put That's a version, money. or like the state sees how, well allocated the funding is through a system like that and decides to fund more and more that type of infrastructure Definitely. which is totally imaginable but just because i'm in the business does uh, creative europe allow you to use the money for the project for for being this kind of capital uh, that could be an experiment no no not, not in this case <laughs> no, 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 no. no. So because we already made like a, we have Use a thing the first productions okay. but the first productions say that they will go back in Okay. to the system so that's actually the income of the productions that if they're successful so they would be would, can become, this creative money would would yeah. feed the, the the first fund should we let the oh, uh, sorry, journeys yeah. continue sorry, and then we open for questions sorry please. yeah i, I <laughs> love the excitement <laughs> yeah uh, so <laughs> so i just want to show an extra feature on the gift coin that could be interesting for the sphere as well uh, they have added these uh, bonuses that uh, that's called a trust bonus so if you verify uh, that you have that you link your phone to the system, you get a bonus of matching. So you're adding a little bit more complexity to the algorithm, uh, which is becoming sentient of verified nodes inside the system. Because so think of this: I am a rich person. I have uh, hundred thousand that I want to allocate. I create hundred different accounts <laughs> and I put one dollar each for the project and I get a perfect matching from the so these type of things which increase the score of uh, verified you know identity for which makes it hard to replicate uh, it goes towards a more coherent network a more, more well identified network which resists the civil attack as we call like this multiplication of identity uh, problem um, which I think could be also very useful to, for many other things that are, uh, you know, influencing the coherence of our organization as a whole, which we will come back to later. Uh, another very interesting use of this mechanism is uh, uh, the Taiwanese government 
um, and the Taiwanese government uh, actually like didn't even allocate any funds. They they gave this like <laughs> presidential uh, award or something to the winner, but. Uh, Basically, people. This this is a non-financial application, so we could look at it as political voting, um, and they allowed every citizen that submitted a phone number to have 100 tickets, and they would allocate with the same logic to uh, you know projects that would help go towards. Uh, Agenda 2030. SDG goals uh, that were laid out in these categories. So essentially, you know, raising awareness of uh, these sustainable projects uh, through the reflection of uh, citizens' uh, preferences and so on. So our maybe, maybe just to, to wrap that up. So that could be used within the sphere to decide on which project should be uh, incentivized or not even without money yes just as a way to govern projects from within yes so actually uh, just to wrap that up um actually gitcoin didn't start with the structure gitcoin started with uh what we you know call bounties mm -hmm. basically uh, i want something built in the crypto ecosystem like there's something missing like i need this uh, governance module that i desperately want to use for the sphere but nobody has developed it so I say, hey guys, I put uh, you know 50k on the table. Whoever develops it, uh, you know, with these parameters, uh, gets this money. So that type of bounty structure actually comes very close towards this, uh, you know, calling for a performance or you know, like maybe a venue wanting a, a certain theme inside their uh, you know yearly schedule or something like that. So you have both these. Uh, the possibility of performers submitting their performance or uh, bounties that are you know calling for performances and so on so it's quite uh, we have quite a versatile uh, landscape to be inspired from jem can you can you just say again the that second aspect uh, that you mentioned the the function that stops the sybil attack i missed the aspect you just said oh yeah they're Obviously, you could set up a bunch of identities that could make an optimized matching structure, but I missed the part where you said what the functionality was that would stop that. Uh, so let me give an, another example for everyone. So in Taiwan, this was, uh, you know, you needed to have a SIM card submitted to your tickets. I mean, also the uh, you know, non-financial nature also reduces the incentives of cheating in that game, but, you know, buying a sim card in itself is a you know a increasing the cost of acquiring this power basically but uh, since we are more on the you know financial or economic side we can implement more of these features that uh, you know adding a bonus to extra verification so if you connect your i mean this is a very terrible example and i'm so sorry for this but like if you connect your facebook for example to uh, this system, then then you get uh, five percent more matching. If you connect your decentralized identity provider to the system, then you get twenty five percent more matching. So all in all, since it's all these percentages are all relative amounts, the system starts preferring verified uh, nodes rather than you know potentially civil nodes which uh, cannot verify themselves because they are uh, adversarial. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have the next. Uh, is memory, which, uh, you know, connected to this notion of the unarchive. Um, so as you have heard in multiple occasions, um, <laughs> Uh, the interests of the early sphere uh, community has revolved around the possibility of derivative works and uh, collective free. An environment within which everyone can borrow, appropriate, use, reuse, uh, and remix freely. And for this environment to emerge, um, the individual must lower one's own walls of uh, you know, proprietorship and so on. 
And as in most social dynamics, this requires a lot of trust, whether in a romantic relationship or a sense of community. Uh, for that trust to emerge, we have to architecturally promote a sense of security. So this perhaps naive desire led us to research intellectual property law in order to find the right legal primitives which enable such freedom on a contractual level while sustaining the IP rights we and protecting them in the outside of the organization. So um, I don't know how you found Raphael, but uh, we have an IP specialist that is uh, a lovely person who is, I hope, uh, connected. Yeah, he's, he's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We found him in Helsinki. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he, he, he was linked to Circus already then through uh, Maxim Komaro. <laughs> He's a circus IP dude. Yeah. Not, to be, not to be gossiping about you, Raphael. No, he's uh, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he likes me. Well, yeah, so we've been having some workshops with him to uh, you know, look at what are the existing legal primitives because the legal uh, landscape is like a computer. You, know? you cannot speak to it in a human language, in a sense. You have to speak to it in the legalese, essentially. And so we were looking at what are the what is the vocabulary with which we can you know uh, create this sort of endosphere that would facilitate this IP commons uh, uh, inside a free creative environment inside, but actually you know would maintain coherence outside of it. So like the sphere as an entity would sort of uh, protect the rights of its productions uh, outside of, of itself essentially. So uh, what Raphael pointed me towards was uh, this model of uh, collective management organization. And so collective management organizations, I would much rather have Raphael talk about this, but I will explain uh, what I understand of it, is basically um, groups of copyright uh, owners, I guess you know uh, much better than I do. We're, we're in this the building right now. Okay, oh, this is, okay. so, <laughs> um, so um, these organizations bundle together um, uh, rights, uh, rights owners uh, and protect them, you know, against, uh, not against, but, uh, you know, monitor their use and negotiate licenses for them and so on. So like sort of regulate the economic activity in a legal fashion for this collective. Uh, actually, I wouldn't call it. Let's yeah, just say what you basically do is that if someone earns, if, if someone uses uh, our music uh, in a professional way, we get and earn money from it. We get a part of that money. Fantastic. So and we and still collect all music that is played in Sweden and then distribute it to Sweden and other countries and all other countries do the same. So I think this is a very awesome model and it's super uh, it's, it's hilarious that we are here right now <laughs> it's crazy um so what we want to like the way we want to uh, take this further if you will uh, like the, the way we want to mutate this model of uh, collective management organization is by you know making it contributive collective management organizations in a sense that instead of having you know, you have the, the other room where you have the signed uh, autographs of all the artists, but instead of having individual artists with individual rights, how about we have, you know, collective rights, which are managed collectively outside. So, you know, in a way, IP Commons on the inside, collective management organization on the outside, which, you know, we hastily called uh, contributive uh, collective management organization. And, uh, yeah, it, these are, you know, all ideas on the go. We will, you know, keep having these workshops with Rafael and see, you know, where we can take these ideas towards, or how how does it actually work to, you know, create a new type of uh, social contract in the sphere. Um, but I want to also talk about the other aspect of the institutional memory, which uh, we are coining as the unarchive, sort of this new way of sharing. Uh, proto uh, creative works uh, and how to you know enable everyone to be able to you know interface with each other's works and the uh, the parts of the proto parts of each other's works um, 
So two years ago, I started working for uh, a project called Pando. And uh, this project uh, was trying to democratize this uh, version, con this notion of version control systems. Mm -hmm. uh, is anyone familiar in the room? So version control system, maybe you've heard of Git. GitHub, Git, so Git, <laughs> GitHub is built on this protocol that is called Git, which is a version control system. So what it does is that you see in this image, uh, you have a master branch, basically the code base. And in the master branch, that's where the code lives. If you think of it as a sphere, the website, the website of the sphere lives there. So Eric has this revelation and he wants to, you know, make the website upside down you know he wants to completely change it so he starts implementing these changes but git allows eric to create a version of the website to start experimenting with this idea otherwise if he starts experimenting with this idea on the main branch mm -hmm. uh, you can have these collisions especially if you're collaborating uh, in a uh, in increased numbers so uh, this type of branch structure allows for the freedom to creatively express uh, different type of ideas and then uh, you know the way it rejoins the main branch as you see uh, what we call pull requests so you create a request that hey look it looks fantastic upside down so uh, you know pull this back to the main back. branch so because Git was created by this uh, master evil, I, I don't say evil, sorry, <laughs> uh, but like a weird mastermind called Linus Torvald, uh, who is Finnish. Finnish, sorry. Finnish? Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he actually tried to uh, empower his own production of uh, an open source kernel, which is called uh, Linux, that, uh, you know, Android, if you have one, it uses that. Um, he wanted to harvest the hive mind of the collective, uh, you know, developers, while being, you know, the king that sits on top of this, uh, you know, crazy stigmatic organization. So what he was doing is that every time there's a, a, a pull request, a request to merge back to the main branch, he would look at it, and some of them he would completely ignore, some of them he would look at, and he would be the dictators to say, yes, you are worthy, you can. Uh, take part in, you know, uh, in, in the main branch. So that's fine and all because it works with his process, but actually this is the same architecture we use uh, in open source today. So like there is this one guy called the maintainer and he has to decide what gets merged and what gets left, left out. So it's with a given project, within any given open source project, uh -huh. because it's all using Git. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Git and GitHub and whatnot. GitHub as the interface. So, what my project was trying to do was uh, to democratize this logic. So, what we did was to take this maintainer, uh, trash it, and instead put a, a voting module that everyone who's contributing in the code base would actually vote on what gets to be merged and whatnot. You, know, you can imagine that this is like. Mm -hmm coming with a lot of baggage of like inefficiencies and so on. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was almost like a statement as a, you know, a collectivization of Athenian code bases. Yeah, and, and it doesn't matter too much. Meaning when you have a Pando Wesper structure, you have a tool for formalizing contributions inspired by the, the, the open source culture. Yes. Then the way that you decide to actually do the pull request it's up to the collective. You can have a more or less oligarchic or totally Athenian mode, but it, it doesn't really matter. Yes. What is really important here, and I think that's one of the like bread and soul of the, the, the sphere, is that we have that possibility. People like the anarchy, people share their processes, and then there's a moment, and I think that we need to put a lot of energy there, where there's gonna be thresholds of formalization. And then you will feel the work taking shape. And then that work that took shape might end up having an IP management structure. Most of them won't because you don't necessarily have an IP on every single process that you generate, but there will be a moment where you want to have that. 
And if we get to that point, then the sphere really rocks because then we can really go outside in the world and have productions that are uh, solid enough. And, that, and that's where the, the genius here at play comes in. <laughs> you know? uh, anyway, uh, so if we make this a little bit more colorful in the context of cultural production, you can see the master as, you know, the main composition and whatnot, and then, you know, the blue as the saxophone and the orange as the vocals and so on. So like everything is produced in parallel and then merged together to produce something else. Um, and like Eric said, a, a, a byproduct of this is the tracing of the lineages of production. So you start attributing. writing the choreography and someone doing the music all becomes visible for the system. And like Eric said, we don't, this uh, has nothing to do with IP. It's just, you know, hashes that connect, uh, you know, digital objects to each other. So now you have Yeah, now we can assume maybe they got some uh, that's that's a, a whole question to be investigated. Yeah. What is it that we want people to share? Yeah, what, what is the material? Well, yeah, when, when does the material become interesting enough to get registered yeah. by you as an artist? So it, for me, it's like a visualization question. <coughs> How to create an interface yeah. that yeah. makes it very easy. To say, oh, something is taking shape here, you know, like we yeah. make it felt so that then it naturally spreads. And if we put more energy on that side of things, we won't have to put too much energy on the IP management, like full on legal defense, because it will be clear that, hey, here is the process. It has been collected in these different yeah. ways. So less energy on the defense, more on the in collective intelligence taking shape. That, that'd be the ideal, I would say. We go to um, just another mode, like speaking uh, mode. Where, uh, I think you gather the this. There was something happening when we logged in, out in. I think it's just something with the with the internet that we're super share screen again. Um, I didn't. I didn't hear a break. I can hear everybody fine. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So no. Perfect. All right. Okay. So that's Pando, and then we move on to a third layer, which is the cooperative layer. I will just mention this briefly because uh, I think the idea doesn't need much elaboration from like a technologist or whatever. Um, cooperatives are interesting because. Um, they internalize their supply suppliers and they internalize their uh, customers. So it's sort of like has this capitalism 2.0 aesthetic where its interests are very closely aligned with uh, who they are serving essentially. Uh, it's Wikipedia definition is uh, a cooperative is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned enterprise. So, I mean, that does sound like the sphere to me in so many uh, levels, but uh, a, a very important part of that, I think, is also what I um, understood from interviewing some circus artists was that um, having to write grant applications for the EU or having to write grant applications for the state uh, is sort of this dreadful task that uh, like none of them have the training for, but you know, most of them have to go through that, uh, you know, takes off this time that they could, you know, pursue their creative endeavors with. So I think creating uh, a structure where, you know, certain organelles 
can take up that functionality to do that for uh, you know, the creative commons. Uh, I think it's a great model and we have a lot of inspiration to find in the cooperative model for this. Um, and yeah, ob obviously it reduces overhead costs the more people come together. So uh, I guess that's also the same logic for uh, a collective management organization as well. Uh, you know, instead of everyone hiring their own branch rider, you know, you have five branch riders operating in tandem, serving a, a commons and so on. Um, so next up we have the trust layer. I think we are a bit over time. Um, so this is uh, an interesting subject because in the end, uh, how does one participate in the sphere? How does one uh, get seen by the system? How does one uh, interface with the state's funding apparatus? So these are uh, places where we need you know, civil resistance, where we need sort of uh, the network to become visible to itself. And having a central authority that uh, tells people you can be part of this and you cannot, uh, it's a little bit of a you know, problematic scenario. So yeah, when I was thinking about um, this notion, I stumbled into an inspiration uh, from the concept of web of trust. And Web of Trust is basically, uh, as Philip Zimmerman, the creator, uh, calls it, um, describes it. Uh, as time goes on, you accumulate keys from other people you may want to, you may want to designate as trusted introducers. Uh, everyone else will choose their own trusted introducers, and everyone will gradually accumulate and distribute with their key a collection of certifying signatures from other people, with the expectation that anyone receiving it will trust at least one or two of the signatures. This will, this will cause the emergence of a decentralized, fault-tolerant web of confidence for all public keys. So this is a, a, actually a cryptographic innovation. So like taking this uh, social paradigm is, uh, you know, uh, a very contemporary notion. And, and I would like to show an example of that, uh, of how this actually works in production. So this is a project called Circles. It's a project based in Berlin that's trying to have a non-state approach to universal basic income. And <clears throat> basically the, the way it works is that um, in order to be uh, a recipient for this basic income, this mint of tokens basically, uh, you have to be trusted by at least three people inside the network. So if three people trust you, you become trusted. And then you can allocate, extend your trust to uh, new parties. So it's an interesting notion. Uh, will that work or not? Uh, was unclear. So this is how it looks. You know, three people trusting each other. So the one on the upper left doesn't actually have the have enough references to itself. The one on the right does, and so on. So this was a couple of hours after they launched uh, last month. This was the shape of the network. Uh, and a couple hours later than that, this was uh, the shape of that network. So like, this is for a universal basic income structure, self-generated. Yeah. So nobody actually vetted anyone here. It's like all, uh, and you can you know, raise your standards of what it means to be trusted. You, know? you can say, oh, now that we have this gigantic network, it's not three verifications, but it's five verifications, or it's three verifications with this uh, other condition to be satisfied or something. So you can imagine such a web of trust system having uh, synergy with, uh, for example, the quadratic funding mechanism that if you are part of this network, then you can propose a, a grant application so that we don't have spam, uh, spammers inside the grant process. And if you, uh, so this, this is a very useful concept that uh, allows any type of computer to have a sense of community. Because again, computers don't understand human notions and this type of parameterizations, listing can understand, uh, you know, uh, how the community attributes itself without a central uh, sort of bureau selecting uh, who gets to be part of it or not. 
So uh, all in all, uh, we are trying to create a self-sustaining, self-organizing organization, which is reinventing modes of production and interrelationality. Uh, while doing so, it's very relevant not to so succumb to posterity of a solution, uh, but to keep an open mind and look for the uh, most peculiar places for inspiration. Um, perhaps if we do a good job, the other social spheres can look at com contemporary circus arts for inspiration on how to self-organize. Well, hey. Very good. That's one of the versions. Yeah. You have a minimum number of users in order to, for it to work. And if we working with like three users, you need 3,000 or, or a, a lower limit. For the sphere? As a fear, as an because the cases that Jen just presented is for the coder community. It's yeah. like a, a fantastic open ended, open source community with thousands of people coming in. The sphere, as it is now, would start, it doesn't have the same pretense. Well, so it, small, small networks are also quite sizable, actually. If you think about everybody who's submitting you know, a grant application in the circus arts and their mothers who are voting for them on the <laughs> platform, you have you know, 300, 400 people. That's but but you, have, you have like for the system to work, you have, do you need a minimum number of, of people? I mean, it's, it's in, a, in a logical sense, yes, because like we are putting in effort and so on, but it's not like, you know, you pass the threshold, now it's green light or something. It no. works with, you know, with with us. Us. Yeah, with us. Yeah. if you have a fund, you know, for the funding one, for example, it works even if like one person uh, allocates something, everything will be matched uh, to that person, you know. So it's just not functional, but... Uh, but then we also talk about the, the, from the audience perspective, the Irish platform, hello, also about the audience seeing it like a lot of ways of venues and presenters yeah. to make the audience engagement of a show because the audience could actually see a show and then together with the presenter request for spawning for yeah. a second version or for that show to come back two years later yeah. within the system if we actually bring the presenters into the network and the local audience and the, so, so it could also lead to the audience activity or interaction that the venues are looking for we start with an existing uh, network that's that's the difference with like many of the silicon valley startups that will build with the premise uh, build it and they will come in yeah. this case we start like the grant is structured around a network of partners and it's very easy to imagine it growing uh, organically yeah. so it sounds this, this view sounds a little like uh, there's an app or several apps for spotify where you can see who who is listening to your music where so if it turns out your band has a lot of uh, listeners in Düsseldorf, maybe I should go there. Ah. And make a game. And make a game, yeah. 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 And I, I just want to emphasize that the new kind of audience development is needs. I mean, this is an interesting uh, aspect of, of, the, of the issue of audience development with, that is somewhat <coughs> stuck in, in uh, a longing for this mm -hmm. other audience. Yeah. Uh, maybe an invested audience or a, a, the possibility for the audience to participate in this way uh, will show uh, something else. I mean, it's, uh, I, I really, I'm really curious about the audience development aspect of this year. But, yeah. but also um, without moving with the big data, sorry, I talked yeah. to my account, but because I was one of the ones fighting maybe five years ago in the Nordic sector, because the British Arts Council Can and, a lot of, into, sorry, yeah. and a little lot of British uh, <laughs> big data people came to the Nordic uh, Parliament and discussed the fact that they could do all the programming mm. of all British venues through big data by the audience requests for what should be programmed and created. So why do you need artistic directors and why do you need peer committees when the audience can choose? And I was one of the ones arguing against this mm -hmm. because this had nothing to do with art. I was ordering how to use the venues and spaces not to present stuff Absolutely. so this would work against this as well while still including but not permissioning that i don't want to use it all, depending on the audience yeah. super key because like, it sounds like it's more democratic if we go with the big data mode and at the end of the day maybe we want to preserve some curation 
the singularity within the network. Sorry, because people, uh, the audience, you, if you ask them, they, they will guess what they will know. No, so, they know what they say no they one do. will suggest yeah. anything else. And I actually like this definition of art that it's a um, product where uh, supply exists before demand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It inspires the man. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's for the last. So that, that maybe we need to take a mental note that mm -hmm. we need to protect that way of conceiving art production and circus, because otherwise yeah. we will be guess, remembered yeah. as the people again the generated this, circus. <laughs> again, this one as an example of, of what you're saying. No one wanted a touch screen. <laughs> there we have several versions of, of very advanced things and buttons. And then one guy thought, hmm, let's skip the buttons and just have a touch screen. But no one wanted this. There was no demand for it. Mm -hmm. And now very few mobiles mm -hmm. have, have a button. Yeah. Blockchain is similar. <laughs> yeah, blockchain, yeah. <laughs> <That's great. Yes. laughs> and it's a uh, uh, Swedish company. They actually want to give. Mm -hmm. You should read and look at the philosophy. Yeah. Uh, Seems to be that. Probably down with some. Uh, some. Ah, uh, 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 it's frozen. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but yeah, audience development in that perspective sense is, yeah. is something that will gain a life of. Still, on the other hand, uh, the question is. Yuri from the building. I'm interested in that. Yeah. 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 Talk to me, Rafael. They don't need to be developed. We as well uh, need uh, to understand what okay. they all want to be developed. Rafael, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Eric, uh, I like what you said about um, um, allowing certain collectives within the sphere to choose whether they want to move with the IP management principles or not. I think giving them um, that freedom to, to take certain rules um, makes a lot of sense, uh, especially at different stages. Uh, where maybe as a collective they are not ready to put it out, or it's uh, only for internal sharing. But I think that's uh, one of the key aspects of uh, choosing. Uh, just like in a in a contract, we always argue, um, you know, with which uh, the law of the country that would govern the contract. Here, you can choose the principles that govern the creation itself. I, I like um, that aspect and. Um, Chem and I, I think uh, while I was talking to Chem, we were also looking at uh, maybe participating in different rooms where uh, you have different uh, sets of rules or different levels of rules based on um, the creative commons so that um, you know how far you can push uh, the envelope in certain rooms. Are we, are we were muted. Yeah. We were muted. Sorry, I have I was just saying uh, it's lovely to see you, man. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's and it's great to see how like your discussions with Jem are, are seeping through and informing the, the whole imaginary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one other uh, aspect is the uh, uh, if if you look uh, that I, I was looking there are some um, there are some blockchain uh, uh, kind of private uh, copyright registry service, like one is called Proof of Existence. Um, and uh, over the past five or 10 years, people have moved away from uh, state copyright offices to private registries. 
to register their work and uh, because when you think of credit and, and trademark, it, the, the, the principles of uh, anteriority or who created it first always come into play. So the, the timestamp uh, is, is most um, important. And um, um, so like uh, this blockchain platform uh, proof of existence, uh, it only, it, it always, it, it shows exactly that, just proof of existence or proof of possession. It doesn't show proof of ownership, but I think through the layer that uh, that and uh, I mean this is not just private registries, but any copyright office in the world I don't think can um, by holding a registration certificate from any copyright office. I don't think that's completely valid proof to say that you were the owner of the work, because even the copyright office uh, makes you file something like an affidavit where you. Um, are kind of saying yourself that you are the creator and you created it on so and so date and you're giving a copy of, of the work but it doesn't really show ownership so that's why um, I like um, uh, the trust level where at a certain level I think also within the sphere we will be able to establish that ownership or establish that proof of ownership for things that are maybe created on the sphere or transacted in part on the sphere so uh, I really like that part, Kev. Yeah, all extra features, uh, you're going to be building them, Rafael. So <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you're talking about. Um, but joking aside, I think, like, uh, did you catch the part that, like, we're inside the collective management organization right now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the only difference is, I think, maybe less contributive and more collaborative. Because uh, when you say contributive, uh, members of uh, collective management organizations are already contributing. Like uh, each person, uh, it was like the example, each person's already bringing the milk. Uh, but can, you know, someone else take that milk and make uh, curd or cheese out of, out of it. But in, in modern day collective management organizations, everyone's bringing uh, the same, uh, I mean, similar product. Uh, not, I, I can't say homogeneous, but like in an organization like STEM, everyone's bringing different songs, but people are bringing songs. They're not, they're not bringing something other than songs. Uh, they're, not, they're not bringing other types of products or derivative works uh, for that. Matter. So what, would you, what, what was your recommendation uh, for, the, for, for the name? Or it was actually the, your recommendation, which was a collaborative collective <laughs> management. I thought you were, uh, okay, okay, cheers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great idea. Though. <laughs> <laughs> but then in, uh, just, just to make things even more complicated, in Europe, you also have both copyright laws and author's rights laws. Mm -hmm. So if, if someone else want to claim ownership of my work, that may be very problematic but if someone else want to make money on my song and give me parts of it that's over here this is what we did here yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah. but the, the author's right is based on the the idea that i created my songs and i decide where to use them mm -hmm. and it doesn't control the author's right it, it'd be nice to have a, a full working session about like where you're at because of like what's already existing and yeah. what you would wish for, yeah. just at opening up the speculative realm of what we would wish for, and not audience development, but what are these new potentialities yes. that are around the corner and, and the circus world being at the forefront. Yeah. And I want to add that, oh, yes, that Martin has been a part also of this year since the very beginning, okay. uh, contributing to the first application we did for EU uh, in the sense we had couple of meetings and we've been talking after that quite a lot so it's not a coincidence also even if you didn't meet before mm -hmm. and also that we're in the mm -hmm. same music for this it's not mm -hmm. really a mm -hmm. coincidence but i think it's ah. really great that rafael is here but there's a thick layer of law in, in law here and there's um as long as you move around in, in like my my domain of art music or circuits it's not a big problem but but when you go to the big regals when you earn your first million euros, that's when you get protected over your work.
But I, I agree, yes. I would love a session on this, and maybe with some people who actually know something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Don't just have a lot of opinions. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> or both of us. <laughs> I give you a <laughs> uh -huh. uh, we I think we also I mean the offline part of it which I which I think is very important to to uh, to validate or maybe ensure compliance uh, with the rules that were set uh, in the sphere um, would be really important even for aspects like when um, when Amy mentioned maybe the uh, I, I don't know if it was Amy. I, I just judge by the voice, but uh, but when like Amy mentioned that uh, the the collection, uh, the excess collection could come back in this sphere. Um, that's a collection that happens maybe you know a lot of the time it happens offline if it's happening in cash, uh, or people or you know even if people are making unauthorized uh, copies of your work, printouts of your work, um, things like that. So. Uh, effectively, this trust network, uh, if we could uh, think and install how um, they could physically uh, also or offline also carry the trust or represent this trust, uh, carry the idea of the sphere in, into, their, into their lives off the chain, um, that would be the missing element in, in most systems um, today because uh, some of my clients. Uh, uh, we do underreport figures. I mean, they do underreport figures um, for the to to pay lower license fees or to to uh, to pay you know less collection amounts. And they there are lots of uh, um, uh, sub licensees and publishers who uh, do a deal for a certain amount of units and then go out and print um, excess uh, units or way more units um, than that. And this happens uh, in um, North Asia and South Asia very specifically a lot. So I, I think this kind of offline trust system w w should be a bit of focus also. Yeah, and maybe maybe on that I'll say something about uh, we were discussing audiences there. And I, for me, the audience uh, involves the artists and the producers and, and everyone and it's kind of like I would more call them fans, you know, and I think One of the questions, like where um, come into with fan fiction or on forums, you know, or the places where the people who really know how to splice about what makes a circus gesture um, particular to a certain artist are the fans who will go on about it for a long time on a forum. Or, you know, where did the, was the seer wheel in circus really developed by seer? Was it uh, rather further innovated later on? You know, I think that these are the kind of the, the fragments that will become valuable in the sphere are not the kind of uh, the big moves, but the smaller gestures and how they get debated by the audience, you know? And I hope, I think that in the sphere, we should empower the audience and that includes all of us to be. Economic even. This is just a side note, but it was fun that you mentioned the Rusi, because we mm -hmm. have like two of the most innovative, more interesting Rusi artists uh, that I've seen in the world, in the room. Just now, and that's hey! <laughs> so they're, they're working on the, on the development of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. The Seer Wheel is in the next newsletter, so maybe I will reach out and get some professional opinion. Nice. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask about, um, like we've been discussing the sort of like the IP part of like, what are you gonna, uh, what are you gonna, at which point are you going to set intellectual property to your uh, work? And I'm, I'm wondering, is there really, can we somehow uh, really decouple the, the sphere from, um, from, project-based work so like is there really any way that because I feel like we still with this structure that we're discussing we're still talking about a product like a production there there is something that's going to be with uh, that will have intellectual property and um, 
but I think within the performing arts community, I think there is a big issue that we are already working in this way, that we are really dependent on projects, like on project-based work, whereas there is a real need to shift away from this kind of work to a more to to value the process, the, the development process of work and the everyday life that brings to the world the creation of whatever projects or productions. And I wonder if there is any way to integrate that into the, um, into the sphere. I think I mean, maybe right. Uh, yeah. The whole idea of the anarchive is, uh, the anarchive is a process seed bank. Like it's about processes. And then if we bring blockchain into the mix, it's because there's a moment where we want to formalize things. It's like, it's, it's a continuum between processes and products. There's a moment where things become products, but I think there is quite a deep commitment. I mean, Joel tomorrow, I think is going to be discussing that quite extensively, but there's a deep commitment in the sphere towards processes. But there's also, I mean, I'm coming from the other end. Like I was part of a research creation lab that never wanted to talk about products. And it's like, for me, it's interesting to be also included in the product development into the, the whole process because we're also integrating the money aspect and the rights and stuff. But I think it's that balance between the processes and the products. If we're able to keep that uh, together, we're going to be able to have this type of sociality that Joel was referring to. You know, you have fan base where people are bringing value by discussing based on their passion, but we are also equipped to go to the market or defend the work that has chosen to be developed on the sphere. So I, I think it's all together and, and it's, it's important and I guess for the next three years and beyond to, to keep that, uh, that mixture alive between the processes and also the product-oriented uh, development. Can, can I ask, because I found this really interesting, yeah, because I think you're absolutely right. I think it's got something to do with this morning session about vocabulary, about the vocabulary of what you choose to call things, because if we could add some kind of space for the lifelong artist uh, development that results in projects or products or doesn't uh, then then we could save space then the sphere could actually be but then we should bring that vocabulary in since we're so project damaged so it would be really nice that's mm -hmm. so smart of you to lift that yeah, and also we can kind of look at the sphere as, uh, you know, a protocol. So like you can actually add things on top of it uh, without disturbing, uh, you know, the lower layers. So, uh, you know, the, the, I think, you know, the tragedy with art, philosophical tragedy with art is that it, it, it goes towards the market, like art market is the tragedy itself. So kind of like liberating art from the market would be, uh, the ultimate, you know, sort of liberating movement. But uh, again, like, like that woman said, like revolutions are bloody. Maybe you shouldn't like to be too revolutionary and so on. I think there is like a um, a good point in not starting with something unattainable, but then having a protocol approach towards like building towards that vision. Basically, perhaps giving uh, the artist sustenance through as some sort of a UBI system that is powered by a functioning engine, but first you need a functioning engine uh, before you get there, I think. But I think that vocabulary is exactly the right question. I, for me, that pops to mind is just practice, right? It's, it's studio time, whatever, you're a writer, you're whatever, but it is practice. It is the practice of being an artist that is the thing which connects with the UBI towards that. But it can be there from the, be from the beginning, no? Within the logic of the engine don't you think i i, I mean i totally agree and i'm very like happy to, to think about uh, like yale and amy's input uh, and there was uh, um, I'm, I'm thinking that that maybe it could be i mean it really depends on what is it that you uh, work with and then love <laughs> like if, if i'm thinking about energy i mean isn't it uh, my trust like isn't couldn't it be that i work in the studio with this kind of uh, concept or idea for uh, and then maybe I focus more into the area of uh, this specific uh, concept or whatever but it's a part of my artistic process and it does not mean that what I log in is a 
is a performance per se or anything, but I still got the contribution, I mean, retribution to work for two weeks on this concept. And I reached here. I can, I can work the rest of my life with this concept, but I, I could also like have a milestone where other could take off, where I get exhausted or where, when I'm curious for something new. Uh, I'm just trying to think away uh, any kind of like uh, ready made, ready performance in this cycle. Mm. Like, work and logging and get money to work and then and then maybe the 50,000 person that do this uh, feel like oh, it's a performance situation happening right now so we will call this a product <laughs> I, I, I personally the way that I think about it is um, about artistic research and it's uh, it's sort of parallels in a way to academic research or the way it's it's un unfortunately not perceived in that way but in the art sector there is knowledge developed constantly and uh, the knowledge is uh, is decoupled from a production it's it's exactly what Joel said it's about practice there is like a set of practices that are uh, accommodating that world and uh, and if we find some way to really, um, as we are in a session about value flows, if we find a way to sort of quantify or embody or make that, uh, that knowledge production tr more transparent, I'm, I'm just wondering if, I, I feel that the intellectual property aspect might be difficult for sure. It, it can be, it, it's just, not really appropriate for discussing this kind of the, the the practice aspect of it maybe or maybe it is maybe there is a way of of translating it into intellectual pro property but um yeah but I, I think it's what what i'm talking about is in that kind of uh that kind of framework is in in this yeah artistic research perspective yeah the thing on what you're saying yeah and the i think ip is like bazooka for for it's it's a big uh, it, it works only in given circumstances uh, in relation to markets maybe but what you're describing like the knowledge production that's constantly happening through artistic practice i think we need to invent like i don't know if the a new vocabulary but we need to invent new ways to valorizing these processes and that's where we can come in with a whole other set of notions that don't have anything to do with ip management ip management is really coming towards the, the products. Here we're talking about processes, so then maybe we can talk about um, milieus, individuation, trans-individuation, things that take consistency, that are alive, that makes community like thrive. And it doesn't need to be valued monetarily, but it needs to somehow be included in the equation of what makes uh, artists a living. But these, these are all the big questions that, uh, are not just incumbing on, on the sphere to solve, you know, it's, it's more of creating even for that matter, the conditions for the sphere to be a research uh, production unit for that matter. Mm -hmm. One other uh, just as aspect that I just think about also, we should also time out since we ask someone else to maybe round, round up this, but uh, it's just uh, as an artist or circus artist uh, or circus director, uh, what would be cool is it, it, not thinking even about IP or copyright or, or material, whatever. Like just that I, in within the sphere, I have the right or the, the someone is allowing me. And it, I, we don't even have to have like a, a it's, it's predefined that I can take a concept and I can work with it. And it's, uh, it's Leonard's concept. And it's okay with Leonard that I just work. I don't think, we, I don't have to stop. And uh, I mean, we, in the sphere, I can just, keep on working on what, what she has been working on. And I can show it even, I can present it, I can, uh, uh, and then uh, for me, I don't care uh, at all if it's a great IP solution. For me, like, for, like but it has, maybe to, we, we cannot be so many that we think away totally mm -hmm. maybe, but, but if, if I know that Leanne is okay in, in the community, that's cool, then I'm so happy that that can happen. But all of a sudden I can really, uh, I can do some derivative of, of Jay's juggling uh, as a juggler and just steal, steal his stuff and, and work on it for fun and it's okay. 
with but everyone, also Joel, with the audience. Joel, you remember more exactly the example in the undercommons about this this idea of the, 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 the lift. There's a ride and you are not expected to pay someone when he gives you a lift or she gives you a lift, but you're expected to say something about, should I give you something? And then the other person is like, no, 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 it's okay, you don't need to. But there's a whole rituality in the exchange. And that I think we should integrate it in the design because there's, there, it's not just like, oh, we're in an anonymous uh, ascetic mode where everything is to everyone, like communists to the bone, you know? I, I don't think it's gonna work. <laughs> so we need, we need to have some sort of rituality about what does it mean to take up, pick up on someone else's idea and, and make it, signify it somehow, I would you're say. And I, situation. Yeah, yeah, I, I it's saw like it. A, it's yeah. like a really good example of like proof of work being completely decentralized because the work doesn't exist. I mean, you could literally sell goods um, through oral, um, how to say it, uh, through an oral contract because he doesn't want like anything physical to exist about this work. And so the only proof of work is like other people, the audience taking pictures of it. So, and then also like he makes- And the marketing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he makes uh, philosophers in his works like speak to each other that usually wouldn't speak to each other, but like Sina Segal's work lies in kind of like bringing them together and make, creating like a really arbitrary situation of like movement praxis that does like is not important at all for the piece. <laughs> but so, yeah, I don't know, I think there's, it's quite interesting how he like outsources the, the problem of documenting his work and creating ownership through inventing the situation. Yeah. Um, I, I think that touches on really an important aspect of how we assign value. Um, and curation is one of those, one of those uh, mechanisms by which somebody claims value in a particular direction. And, um, yeah, I just think it's the articulation itself, which is really interesting here. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody chooses a part of a work for a particular reason, that is the assignment of value to that, and then the further development of that value. So that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> and I like the idea that that goes both ways. Like in Ole's example, example you know, he checks with Lena if it's okay, but I also like the idea, and this is very much how artistic community also already is, um, that maybe Lena has a way of playing a prank on Ole by inserting that thing into his practice in his next two weeks. And he's like, <laughs> oh shit, I mean, that happens in our practices all the time anyway, but to, if we're talking about this digital analog meeting place, it's about setting up these places that are, do have characteristics we appreciate in our artistic lives, like surprise, a little bit annoying, but something that brings us over two feet into a new perspective. So yeah, love it. 